today, on Thursday, June 16th, uh, this morning's session is on part three of South Effigy Dolores. It's going to be Suffering and the Imago Dei by Dr. Don Goldstein. We'll start with a prayer. And do you have a prayer to the Blessed Trinity? <coughs> it should be on your table. Go with that. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. O oh, Blessed Trinity, we thank you for having graced the Church with Pope John Paul II, and for allowing the tenderness of all our fallen care, and the glory of the cross of Christ, and the splendor of the Holy Spirit, to shine through him, trusting fully in your infinite mercy, and in his triumphal intercession in America, has given us the image of Jesus the Chosen. And has shown us that the holiness is the necessary measure of the ordinary Christian life, and is the way of achieving eternal communion with you. Grant us on this intercession, and according to your will, the graces we implore, in Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Dr. Goldstein writes, We will examine how John Paul II and Salvemici Dolores builds upon the reflections he made in his catechesis on human love, concerning how the human person attains to the fullness of the Imago Dei. This will bring us to consider what Salvemici Dolores has to say concerning the communio aspect of suffering. Specifically, we'll explore the connections it makes between the suffering experienced within the body of Christ and the ecclesial communion that is affected by the Eucharist. Thank you, Dr. Um, I, uh, I have a slight, well, first of all, can I just say, I'm so happy to be here with you. This has been a wonderful uh, experience uh, for, for me, and uh, I'm I enlivened uh, by the uh, questions and, and comments that you offer. Um, and uh, second to that, uh, there's going to be a slight change in today's lectures because I didn't get as far as I wanted in my second lecture yesterday. And so I wanted to finish up uh, some things that I uh, would have wanted to uh, include in uh, yesterday's lecture. Um, and so the thing that's going to uh, be omitted today uh, is um, is from se session from the second session of today, with regard to John Paul's last uh, en encyclical, um, his uh, how he lived out the message of South Fiji Dolor Dolores. That I'm not going to get to, but everything that I would have wanted to say is in your reader in um, under the, the readings for session eleven. Um, it's a section from the end of the beginning, which is. Uh, George Weigel's book on uh, John Paul's uh, final years. Uh, so if you're interested in that, you can find that all in that reading. Uh, so before we begin, are there any questions from, from yesterday or any other, anything else that anyone wants to, to share uh, before we begin? Okay. Uh, so. Yesterday, where we left off was that I was talking about um, how uh, John Paul in South Beach of the Lords discusses suffering from two uh, complementary uh, perspectives, that of the sufferer and that of the good Samaritan. And I've gotten as far as speaking about uh, this perspective of the sufferer, and there uh, we were talking about uh, Santa Fitcher Dolores uh, number 26, <coughs> which is, I think, on page, around page 73, let's see, yes, um, page 73 and following, and uh, talking about how he says that, um, that, uh, that uh, the Christian suffering, experiencing his or her suffering in the dimension of redemption, uh, is able through a process of conversion and interior growth to 
discover the salvific meaning of suffering. And in this process, John Paul writes that Christ, as the interior master and guide, reveals to the suffering brother and sister this wonderful interchange situated at the very heart of the history of the redemption. Uh, and this wonderful interchange reveals, uh, as we saw in Salvation to Dolores number 26, that uh, while suffering is in itself an experience of evil, Christ has made suffering the firmest basis of the definitive good, namely the good of eternal salvation. So that's the experience of, of suffering on the part of the sufferer, according to John Paul. And uh, this um, is really uh, expressed in terms of, um, of the sufferer's gift of self. If you remember in in Gaudium et Spes 24, Second Vatican Council, uh, we saw uh, that uh, the uh, Second Vatican Council says that uh, the, that the, the human person, uh, man, um, can um, can. Uh, he find himself only in a gift of suffering. Get that, that exact um, that exact quote because it's so important. It comes up again and again in um, in John in John in John Paul. Um, yes. So this uh, this is the Second Vatican Council of God, it's best twenty four, saying that um, that the Lord Jesus, when you pray to the Father that all may be one as we are one, opened up vistas close to human reason, for he implied a certain likeness between the union of the divine persons and the unity of God's sons in truth and charity. Uh, I, I believe um, uh, perhaps it was it was Stephen who would, or, or uh, John Hittinger who was bringing up the, the dual aspect of, of truth and love. Um, perhaps with regard to um, to the to the Imago Dei, truth and love slash charity, which in Latin we mean caritas, and in Greek agape. This is the specific word for the for the divine love that God enables us to share and through his son. So the council is saying that um, that, that uh, Jesus implied a certain likeness between the union of the, of the divine persons and the unity of God's sons in truth and charity. This likeness reveals that man, who is the only creature on earth which God will for itself, cannot fully find himself except through a sincere gift of himself. So. All these things that John Paul is saying with regard to discovering the salvific meaning of suffering uh, are, uh, are um, that uh, the sufferer discovers the salvific meaning of suffering uh, through uh, emulating Christ in his gift, uh, gift of self. You know, years ago I took a course at the John Paul II Institute for Marriage and Family uh, in Washington, D.C. I was going to the Dominican House of Studies, uh, but uh, I um, wanted to take uh, this course on marriage uh, and, uh, and celibacy as states of life. And so I chose to take it at this course which at this school, the JP2 Institute, which um, used different language, different modes of expression than what I was hearing from the Dominicans at Dominican House. And my professor, just every day, that JP2 Institute professor was hammering gift of self, gift of self, complete gift of self, perfect gift of self, sincere gift of self. So I actually made it into a drinking game, where uh, every time I gift of self, I'd, 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 take, I'd take a sip. Um, and, uh, and so, I mean, that was the only way that I could like handle it because to me he was repeating it so much that it just lost its meaning. Um, but um, 
And, and these phrases do become, they, we do risk their becoming pat if we, if we repeat them too often. So it's good to, to remind uh, ourselves that, that this is, in fact, a very important concept and that it is, um, and, and that gift of self is, um, is to be understood in terms, in terms of our imitation of, of the um, Trinitarian <coughs> exchange of love that each of the Trinity is constantly, it's constantly, uh, each, each person in the Trinity is constantly uh, giving self to the other members of, of, of the Trinity. And this is, this is um, revealed in Jesus Christ, and this is what Gaudium et Spes means when see Gaudium et Spes 24. This is what Gaudium et Spes 24 is saying that that Jesus <coughs> revealed this when he said when he prayed that they may all be one as as we are one, and that this Trinitarian. Self is then the, the grief of self, rather, um, revealed in Jesus Christ, is then imitated by by man and woman, <laughs> and uh, and in this imitation, it's not like we normally think of imitation as being <coughs> something. Um, something artificial or just a copy. Um, it is also um, in being imitated, it becomes in Christ participated so that in Christ we are actually having, um, having received the presence of the Trinity in us, the indwelling through our baptism, we are brought to actually participate in this Trinitarian uh, exchange of love, which we begin to do with every act of love that we make uh, on this on this earth. Uh, love of uh, whenever uh, we love God, whenever we love our neighbor for the sake of God, as we hear in that prayer known as the act of charity and we will fully participate in this Trinitarian exchange of love uh, in, in the next life with the beatific vision and the communion in heaven. Yes? Seems to be the crux of the matter. And uh, while well, I pontificated against emotion yesterday, um, <laughs> yes, yes. That was last I, night sure, I sure would like to know when I'm doing this that I'm doing it. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's... For those of us who have suffered and are suffering a lot, it's nice every once in a while to go, oh, I'm doing it right, or oh, this is the way to do it. Is there any way to describe that differently? Because this is beautiful poetic language, but I'm not in poetry when I'm suffering. That's, that's right, that's a, and that's a, uh, <coughs> that's a beautiful uh, point, that, uh, that we, uh, when we're suffering, we don't always um, experience the feeling of the presence of God. Um, the simplest answer may not be the most satisfying or complete answer, but it is an answer. Uh, the simplest answer is, I think, articulated in uh, what I mentioned the other day in, in my talk and also here uh, in, um, in step 12 of AA, uh, having experienced uh, have, 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 um, let me find it exactly. I think it's ha having experienced a spiritual awakening, 
uh, as a result of these steps, we carried the message uh, forward uh, to, to others. Um, so this gets to uh, Dorothy Day's uh, spirituality, that we enter into a deeper understanding of appreciation of our union with God when we carry him to others. And this doesn't have to mean um, working in a soup uh, kitchen, although you know, it's a good thing to do. Um, it can mean simply um, being present for other people when you don't really feel like being present for other people. Um, trying not to grouse when we feel like grousing. <laughs> and you know, doing whatever small thing we can to try to bring the light of Christ uh, to others. Um, when we see how our own light uh, can, can awaken God's light in others, then we begin to see that God has, in fact, given us this flame of his, his presence, his love, his grace, and this flame becomes visible in our passing this flame uh, to someone else. Uh, so that's one, one way. Um, another way which it has been helpful uh, to me is to um, keep up the dialogue with God. I, I used to have a spiritual uh, director I was in Washington, D.C., who would tell me that when I, uh, when I prayed that um, rather than focusing on um, repeating certain prayers that I pray daily, even though that's a good thing to do, that I should also just, when I arrive before the tabernacle, I should imagine that God is asking, where is Dawn? <laughs> you know, just like God says to Adam, where are you? And that, you know, rather than just assuming that God knows how I feel, where am I today, I should say, my dear God, here I am before you the tabernacle, this happened, this happened, and I'm feeling like this. Um, because, uh, you know, just as when we're speaking to a, to a, a, a human person face to face, we're not assuming that they're reading our mind. And, and it helps us to express ourselves in, in, in our communicating. Um, that uh, when we express ourselves to, to God, then, um, then we um, have a certain sure knowledge that he knows our thoughts, that, that, um, that we wouldn't normally have, it, in the sense that we have an experiential knowledge. I, I normally have the knowledge of faith that God knows what's on my mind, but I don't have the experiential knowledge. So when we have that, um, that can help us to be more open to how he wishes to, to console us, to answer us, to be present uh, for us. And, and last, uh, something I talk about a lot in my books, just yeah, um, in terms of, of, um, of uh, entering into our, my own uh, emptiness, my own longing uh, for him, and, um, and realizing that I wouldn't have this longing uh, if he weren't somehow already present for me, giving me this, this longing, this, this desire. That desire for God cannot come from anyone else or anything else but God. Um, so I, I hope that, that helps. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Not the least. He's honest. Well, but but. But it's okay, it's okay because. <laughs> you, well, no. I mean, it, it really is. When you think about the people who say suffering is useless, there has to be an answer for that. That practical. I'm a therapist, and so I have people who are in suffering. If I use poetry, they go someplace else. So, I mean, there, there's that reality, and the answer I have to find, I, I understand that. But I was just trying to get at it. Well, I, I think I think from a cognitive behavior, cognitive <clears throat> behavioral. Did you do CBT? No. Oh no. Oh, what kind of therapy or any particular? I'm a family therapist. Uh, uh, sorry. I'm a family therapist. Family therapist. Um, okay, well. But I don't. I don't want to go off. No, no, no. I, no, I think this is relevant. This is relevant, though. Um, I think that in in therapy, you do try to help people to to see. Well, you're thinking this way. Maybe you try to think this way. So, um, so you're thinking, God knows everything about me. God knows I'm suffering. Why don't we do something? 
why not try dialoguing directly with God and saying, here's how, here's how I feel right now, Lord. What are you going to do about this? What do you want me to do about this? Dialogue. You know, this is something that uh, Pope Benedict talks about a great deal in his theology. You see it uh, throughout, throughout Benedict's theology. And I can mention this now because I'm afraid I'm going to give Benedict a short script later on um, because of uh, lack of time to go into everything I want to go to. But Benedict's theology from you know, the days of Ratzinger through his uh, pontificate is based on logos, the word, and dia logos, the word in communication with us. And, uh, and we know uh, from St. Therese of Vizier in the Catechism that prayer is a lifting up of the heart towards God, and it's a communication uh, with God. And any kind of communication with God provides um, an opportunity for prayer. Even just saying, God, I'm angry. God, uh, you know, wh why, why are you doing this? Um, uh, God, I, you know, I'm mad at you. Um, even that opens up the opportunity for God to communicate back if we listen. I, I saw, was that glory with your hand? Uh, you know, that, uh, that dynamic in, in Benedict, at least what helps me is you know, the words that we hear in the liturgy, the words of institution, this is my body given up for me. And so that self-giving of you know, the logos in the liturgy uh, continues to unfold in my life. And so the very <laughs> tones of suffering, right? I mean, you see concretely you know, that gift of self that I've somehow mysteriously participated you know, in, in that self-giving, giving up. I think it helps to bring it down. Well, this is the interesting thing that we're getting to, and I appreciate you mentioning that, that Rowan. Um, sorry to turn my back to you here. I'm just trying to get ahead of myself by making room here. Uh, I, um, what we're getting to, that you're pointing to, is that suffering itself is a kind of communication with God and, this, and, 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 uh, and with neighbor. And this is, this is what... John Paul is going to get to as we progress. Um, so, um, so having described the experience of suffering on the part of the sufferer uh, and, and how that um, expresses self-gift, uh, John Paul turns his attention to the one who looks upon the sufferer with, uh, with compassion. Uh, and that's the Good Samaritan. So uh, the Good Samaritan uh, is discussed in section 29, which is on uh, page 86 and following. Uh, and the, uh, the Good Samaritan, uh, through his acts of charity, reveals uh, that um, that, uh, and here we have in the first line of, of, uh, of 29, that the Good Samaritan reveals that suffering, which is present in, under so many different forms in our human world, in our human world, is also present in order to unleash love in the human person, that unselfish gift of one's I on behalf of other people, especially those who suffer. Um, that uh, unselfish gift of one's eye. Uh, this is um, this is uh, an important concept for John Paul. I believe that uh, Dr. Hittinger uh, talked about it uh, before. This is the phenomenology, the interest in the personal perspective and how it plays out in the relationship with uh, neighbor, the, the relationship with God. Um, the, when, when we speak about self-gift, self uh, one thing that can be um, sometimes submerged, uh, is, especially in the talk of the people from, um, from the John Paul II Institute who, who are you know, gift, 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 is that in order for there to, when, when we have an exchange of love, it never wipes out the 
they never, it can never completely wipe out the separateness of the people in the exchange, um, or the separateness in terms of um, individual, ind individual identity, uh, even though the Trinity are consubstantially one, uh, the three are one, they still um, each uh, have, have their um, personal uh, identity. And it's that personal <coughs> identity that enables them to give to one another. This is this is uh, the difference, really, between uh, Catholicism and, and other religions, such as um, Buddhism. Uh, it, religions that um, re religions such as Buddhism, which, uh, unlike Catholicism, uh, hold that uh, at the end of this life or at the end of the last life that a person lives, uh, that the person returns to the source of being like a drop getting, um, getting you know, absor reabsorbed into the ocean. Um, we, we don't believe that. We believe that, that um, we uh, have, in a sense, the best of both worlds because we do lose the pain of separation from others. That pain of being separate and alone uh, will no longer have uh, because we'll be in a union of love, but we'll be able to experience it as a union of love because we'll retain uh, for forever and ever our I. Because without an I to experience things, there can be no love. Without an I to give, without a, a me to to give myself and to receive others uh, others' gift. Any heaven that does not include an I, a me, is not a heaven that I would possibly want to be a part of. Uh, a heaven that doesn't involve my being able to give love as well as um, receive love uh, is not a heaven uh, truly uh, worth, uh, worth having. Um, so uh, so um, actually, if you look, um, just before 29, we see, we see uh, the, the uh, reference to that in Espes 24. Um, uh, he's, John Paul is speaking, this is on page 86, the last full paragraph. He's saying of the Good Samaritan that he gives himself his very eye, opening this eye, the letter I, to the other person. Um, here we touch upon one of the key points of all Christian anthropology. Man cannot fully find himself except through a sincere gift of himself. There it is. Uh, a good Samaritan is the person capable of exactly such a gift of self. Uh, so, um, so uh, in this way, John Paul is maintaining that the experience of St. Paul in Galatians 2.19, which we looked at earlier, if you remember, uh, I can open up your Bible, uh, Galatians 2.19, uh, 20, um, uh, it's 2.20 in RSV, um, St. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So uh, John Paul uh, is maintaining that this experience that Paul describes being no longer I, this experience of union with Christ crucified, <coughs> is manifest not only in the sufferer, but also in the one who ministers to a sufferer. Both of them are in union with uh, the crucified Christ. Uh, and uh, this consideration of the unselfish gift of one's eye uh, leads um, John Paul to return to Matthew 25, 40, which is uh, the verse that he had cited uh, in, his, in his recording of uh, his, um, his encyclical on, on mercy, divine mercy that uh, that Dr. Meyer was speaking about yesterday, he returns to this verse to describe how man shows 
mercy to Jesus, mercy with quotes, through showing mercy upon his neighbor. So let's just turn to Matthew 25, verse 40. This is a favorite verse of Pope Francis uh, for the year of mercy. Uh, this is from the parable uh, when uh, uh, Jesus speaks about when the Son of Man comes in his glory and before him are gathered all the nations. He's separating them as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And, um, and the, um, the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, this is verse 37, when did we see thee hungry and feed thee or thirsty and give thee drink? And when did we see thee a stranger and welcome thee or naked and clothe thee? And when did we see thee sick or in prison and visit thee? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. Now, in Divas and Misericordia, the emphasis is on Christ in the least of the brethren. He does speak about Christ in the giver of mercy, but the bulk of, of what he's speaking on is, 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 um, is Christ uh, in the least of these. Um, in Psalm Fici Dolores, he um, comes down a bit more strongly on the, uh, the emphasizing that Christ is not only identified with the least of these, but also with the one who has compassion. And we see this in Psalm Fiji uh, the Lord's uh, number 30 uh, on page, um, on page uh, 90, um, let's see, um, no, actually page 90, 91, it's the second paragraph uh, of uh, page 91, he says, these words about love, about actions of love, acts linked with human suffering, enable us once more to discover at the basis of all human sufferings the same redemptive suffering of Christ. Christ said, you did it to me. He himself is the one who in each individual experiences love. That's the least of these, you did to the least of these, you did to me. And as John Paul continues, he himself is the one who receives help when this is given to, or he himself is the one who receives help when this is given to every suffering person without exception. Um, and, and he goes on and he says, um, <coughs> at, and at the same, at one and the same time, Christ has taught man to do good by his suffering, and to do good to those those who, who suffer. Um, in, in this double aspect, he has completely revealed the meaning of suffering. Uh, so he's emphasizing it's not um, either or with where is Christ present. It's it's both it's both and uh, that that Christ is in the the uh, the giver of comfort and in the receiver, the one who needs comfort. So with this, we can now outline uh, a kind of a, a framework uh, in, which, um, in which John Paul uh, shows the, the transformative effects of suffering in the Christian experience. And this uh, framework, which I'm going to outline for you, and I may even continue it on the next board if I'm, if I'm feeling a bit daring and energetic. Uh, I, uh, this, let me just have a completely clean slate here. This framework all um, falls into uh, the um, the um, human. This, this is human suffering uh, 
Um, do you in the dimension of redemption? That's a phrase that John Paul uses in Phoebus and Misericordia. I'm pretty sure that he also uses it in some future Dolores. He likes to speak in terms of the dimension because he, um, it's part of his phenomenological, philosophical language. Uh, it's, it's, uh, we can relate the dimension to the word we talked about earlier, hermeneutic. He's trying to get us to zero in on suffering through a particular lens. Uh, and and uh, because this is going to be the most fruitful lens for understanding this, and I would say as a you know for, as a therapist, this is the the lens through which one would want to have patients uh, uh, understand it. And if the dimension of redemption that is um, revealed to us via the through the Pascal mystery. Um, John Paul uses a lot of these you know, terms, dimension of redemption, Pascal mystery, inter interchangeably, um, because you know they all are about lead to the same thing. Redemption uh, is is affected by the Pascal mystery. So with that. Here, here are the outlines of this, uh, this account of transformative, the transformative effects of suffering by, in John Paul II. Number one, the crucified and risen Christ in in, uh, in revealing the Father's divine love, you can read that as a sacred heart, uh, bestows <coughs> It bestows to us sanctifying grace this is the ongoing fruit uh, of his once and for all suffering so continuation this grace enables the continuation of of his uh, incarnation through time, through um, incorporating the believer into his body. And so through this grace, the, um, the, the believer, the, the man, the woman, every man, every woman in grace, enjoys, enjoys the, um, the divine, the divine, uh, in, in dwelling. So, so through grace we have the divine in dwelling. And actually, a nice way to show this here is that is that we each have the sacred heart in us. You know, Jesus giving Saint Margaret uh, Mary his heart. This is the heart that's given to us that Jesus uh, wishes us to have through his uh, divine indwelling. So that's number one. Number two, <clears throat> by means of this divine in well so 
um, through, which is really spelled longer, but I'm a copy editor. I hate the spelling stuff. There you go. Through the divine. In dwelling. Which is made possible precisely due to Christ's suffering and resurrection, the believer's <coughs> own suffering. Here is a believer suffering, another believer suffering, is transfigured by grace. into a means of imitatio Christi, a means of imita imitating Christ. It, 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 um, it has this power of enabling the believer to imitate Christ because it transforms the believer on the most intimate level. And uh, this is all in, in Salafici Dolores. You can find it in uh, Salafici uh, Dolores uh, number 26, uh, it, it, where John Paul uh, writes of the cruci. The, the answer that the crucified Christ gives from the cross to the suffering person's question of why. Jean Paul says, man hears Christ's saving answer as he himself gradually becomes a sharer in the sufferings of Christ. Uh, Jean Paul goes on, this is also number 26. The answer which comes through this sharing by way of the interior encounter with the master is in itself something more than the mere abstract answer to the question about the meaning of suffering. This goes to the question about why well, can't just give people abstractions. People, um, people want, uh, people want uh, concrete um, answers. Um, John Paul is, goes on to say, for it is above all a call. It is a vocation. Christ does not explain in the abstract the reasons for suffering, but before all else, he says, follow me, come, take part through your suffering in this work of saving the world, a salvation achieved through my suffering, through my cross. Gradually, as the individual takes up his cross, spiritually uniting himself to the cross of Christ, the salvific meaning of suffering is revealed before him. Note that little word, gradually. Uh, for those of you who were at my talk last night, you <coughs> heard me speaking with a bit of concern about some well-meaning, uh, charismatic Catholics who promote things uh, such as inner healing that are um, methods <coughs> which uh, they use to uh, as a means of, um, of bringing people uh, healing through prayer. Um, I, you know, I think that when um, methods or approaches are are used that are based on scripture and the tradition of the church and uh, and uh, are um, based on um, a solid understanding of the human person, um, you know, these things can be helpful. But we have to be very careful, cautious about becoming in love with a method so that's oh well, I do this and you're healed oh you're not healed you must not have been cooperating you know this is what Jesus says <clears throat> that you surrender and you're healed you must not be surrendered enough 
<laughs> you know, some, it, this, it's an oversimplification. I admit there's some, you know, polemic or, you know, agita in my saying this because uh, unfortunately I've just heard it too many times and, and heard it too many times from people who have suffered this kind of attitude from Christians. So, again, John Paul, so we have to be attentive to that John Paul's using the word gradually, uh, that gradually as the individual <clears throat> takes up his cross, spiritually uniting himself to the cross of Christ, the salvific meaning of suffering is revealed before him. This is a meaning that can be, the person can be guided to this meaning by another person, but it's not going to be you or me who reveals this meaning to that person. It's going to be Christ who reveals this meaning to the person on the most inferior level. And Christ does this in his time, in God's time, not in my time or your time. Those of you who may remember that Rudy Valley song, my time, it's your time. No, not in my time, not in your time, um, but in God's own time uh, with um, grace building on nature, building on the way that God has created this person to recognize him and accept him at the, uh, accept his healing at the appointed time. So there is a number three thing. So we have the believers suffering. These are the tears <clears throat> of the believer that has the power to, to unite the believer with Christ. So therefore the believers suffering being transfigured by grace into a means of Vitatio Christi. And so, um, and so um, carrying the power to uh, unite him with Christ serves, serves to elevate the believers. So we have believers, We have them. We have them suffering. The suffering serves to elevate the believer in union with with Christ's own humiliation and exaltation, so that the believer's gift of self, precisely as a suffering self, is received <coughs> by God through Christ as a reciprocation of divine love. So these are the suffering believers imitating Christ and so, and so united with, with Christ, Christ who suffered and Christ who is also risen. Um, and so this, uh, this suffering becomes a gift of self that is received by God, the Holy Trinity. Um, it, it is received through Christ as a, uh, as a reciprocation divine love that's that's uh, that's that's the love that as we saw at in the beginning that that is revealed to us has been revealed through suffering so Christ's suffering 
communicates his love to us. It is a true communi communication, and you know we, we'll, we'll see this in in Latin. It's in the still almost the same way. Christ's love is a communicatio, a communication of love, and we, in communing with Christ, uh, communing with him through our our baptism. Uh, dying and rising with him in baptism, through our communion in the Eucharist, uh, through every act of love that we make, and in a particularly eminent way, communicating um, with him through our suffering. He's, he is, on the deepest interior level, communicating to us his love and enabling us to return it to him as I said, in union with his own humiliation and exaltation, as we saw in Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11, uh, so that we find ourselves in this gift of self. Um, and that is really the heart of what John Paul is talking about, Sala Fitchi and Divorce. Um, before I go on, are there any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes. Um, yesterday, somebody, I think it was yesterday, somebody said something about suffering that is by a non believer or, um, you know, by someone who has no concept of God or anything. Um, I don't know how to express this exactly, but um, it seems to me that suffering that is accepted gratefully, as opposed to suffering which is merely endured, is the key to um, the suffering being useful. And it's hard to have that concept if you don't have a concept of Christ and his love through his suffering. Um, but um, I went through a period of my life in which I... Um, I had a congenital problem that made me um, unable to walk and gave me excruciating pain. And yet I had two children to raise and I had to live through that. Um, it took me five years to get the surgery that would correct it. In the process of that, I received a gift that as a physician has been very valuable, maybe the most valuable thing I've ever been given in my life. I don't use it very often, but somewhere in that five years, I came to realize that I couldn't do this on my own, and that he had to do it for me. And there were times that I actually experienced being almost a physical being carried through it. I don't talk to patients very often about that, but every now and then, it's just, I guess the spirit says, now's the time. And it becomes a key to unlocking for them the fact that I lived through this. I lived through something that was not possible to live through. I lived through it, and now I am on the other side of that. And there's something in the sharing of that. It's not yes. giving them the idea that they can do this too or anything, but something in sharing that, it becomes a key for them to see. In fact, I have had patients actually get up from the table and say, you know what? And this was when I was in the process of this mm -hmm. suffering. Wow. You know, you're cheerful, you're happy, you're content, and you're a lot worse off than I am. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get up and just go back to work. And that was the most valuable thing in the world to me, to see people. I certainly wouldn't do anything. But there was something about my suffering shared that gave them a gift that they could use to, um, I, I guess, change their hermeneutic of life. <laughs> that's that's beautiful, and you know, as you point out, you weren't giving them a method; you were simply being a witness, right. and that witness created the space uh, oh. through which God, through the Holy Spirit, to, to touch them. Um, it's an interesting question with regard to redemptive suffering of others um, uh, who are not uh, who are not Catholic. Uh, there's 
uh, a very good book on this that I highly recommend by Victor Frankl, a Jewish uh, yeah. yes, psychologist, yes. Uh, founder of the <coughs> school of uh, school of psychology known as logotherapy, called Man's Search, Search for Meaning. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, you know that's the best uh, the best account of um, uh, of how one might find meaning in suffering, um, with, with even uh, if one is not uh, Christian, um, and how suffering might uh, become redemptive. Um, uh, I was scared to read it because it does talk about his experiences in the Holocaust, and 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 I um, was afraid it might be too graphic. But when I actually started reading it. I found that uh, it's written in a very gentle manner, uh, and it's not uh, lurid. It's um, it's something that I think you know even someone who has trouble with triggers could could read it and get a great deal uh, out of it. Uh, I draw upon it in my most recent book, Remembering God's Mercy, 